Have you ever stopped and read the instructions when you make a bag of popcorn, or do you just throw it in the microwave? I really like popcorn directions. Instead of giving a flat time like other microwavable foods, popcorn bags usually say something along the lines of heat until popping slows to one or two seconds between pops. Each time I make popcorn, I obsess over this, and once the popping starts to slow, I carefully count for two seconds. If a pop interrupts me during that time, it stays in the microwave. I follow the directions I think as well as anyone could, and yet I swear, more than a quarter of all popcorn kernels that are in the bag end up unpopped. You have to wonder what kind of research they're doing to write these instructions. And I get it, popcorn is a food that's pretty liable to burn, so they're probably playing it safe. But I feel like we can do better. I want to be able to say how long I need to wait if I want blank percent of popcorn kernels popped. There's got to be a way to quantify this. There's got to be some interesting physics here somewhere. And there is. In fact, on our way to figuring out what the best way to microwave popcorn is, we're going to need to understand some food science, we'll need to learn some signal processing and statistics, and we'll even learn how astronomers were able to detect gravitational waves. Hopefully, by the end of this video, you'll at the very least have a better way of microwaving your popcorn. A kernel of corn bred for popping is basically a hard shell called the pericarp or hole filled with starch, interspersed with pockets of water. When the kernel is heated, the water attempts to expand, but it's held back by the hole, so pressure builds up. Once this pressure reaches the breaking point of the hole, it cracks open and allows the water to escape as steam. Usually, a sudden release of pressure like this would cause the material to fly everywhere in an explosion, but the hot water briefly turns the starch into a gel, like when you thicken sauce with cornstarch so it stays together as it expands, and then immediately dries out when the steam is gone. This leaves the starch in this foam kind of state, with microscopic pockets where the water used to be, and that's what gives popcorn its fluffy texture. Kernels can pop into two classes of shapes, mushrooms and butterflies. Mushrooms are the rounder, tougher variety that you usually see in prepackaged flavored popcorn, and butterflies are the more fragile, softer kinds that you get at movie theaters and in your microwave. We've bred different varieties of popcorn that mostly pop into one shape or the other. When it comes to breeding though, there's one single trait that the popcorn industry cares about more than anything else, and that is popping expansion. The taste? Not that big of a deal. It mostly comes from butter anyways. The smell? Same thing. It's mostly butter. But the more a kernel expands from its original size, the lighter it'll be and the better texture it'll have. More expansion also means that movie theaters can fill people's buckets with less food mass. Even though popping expansion is by far the most important measure of quality that farmers look for when selectively breeding, it is at odds with some other important traits. One big example is intact holes. Ideally, the shell of each kernel would be weak and break up into small pieces so consumers don't get annoyed with all the stuff caught in their teeth. But the stronger the shell is, the more pressure it can withstand, and the bigger the kernel pops. So this is a classic case of multi-objective optimization, just like balancing fuel usage and travel time on satellites. Breeders need to find a balance between these traits, but they mostly lean towards popcorn that pops bigger. So expect kernels to get caught in your teeth. Some studies have shown that large kernel size is correlated with a better unpopped kernel ratio, but... Bigger kernels also tend to have suboptimal expansion. Popcorn companies prefer for some kernels to remain unpoppable and for the ones that do pop to pop well. That's better for consumer satisfaction than having every kernel pop but be really small with a bad texture. So it's kind of inevitable that a bag of microwavable popcorn will have a lot of kernels that just won't pop. According to this study, that should be around 10% of them. Shell strength, volume, shape, moisture content, types of starch, position in the microwave, all of these variables can affect the time that a kernel takes to pop. When you add up many random variables, each with any probability distribution, the resulting variable follows a normal, or Gaussian distribution, or a bell curve. This is a result of the central limit theorem. A probability distribution gives us the probability that a variable will have a certain value. For the Gaussian distribution, variables are more likely to be close to the average and less likely to be far away. A bigger standard deviation means that the values are more spread out. 
So you can define any Gaussian curve with only the mean and standard deviation. The reason that we care so much about Gaussians is, again, this thing called the central limit theorem. It turns out that independent samples taken from the sum of many distributions will always be Gaussian. You can see this clearly when you roll multiple dice. The distribution of numbers you can get rolling one die is uniform, they're all equally likely. But when you roll two dice, seven is more likely than two. The more dice you roll, the closer it'll get to a bell curve. For this reason, even without knowing anything about popcorn, it's a very good guess that the time it takes a kernel to pop will follow a normal distribution. If that's true, then we should be able to find what that distribution is by making a bag of popcorn and collecting the data. We can then use it to estimate the time it'll take to pop a given percentage of the bag, and even how many seconds we should wait between pops to pop a given percentage of the bag. So to collect the data, I'm going to use an audio signal. I'll just record the sound of popcorn popping from the time I start the microwave. The results look pretty good. But I need to somehow turn this into a list of times that the kernels pop. We could do that by just looking at the plot and writing them all down, but there's probably several hundred kernels for each bag, so it would definitely be better to automate that. Let's look at the sound of one pop and see if there's some pattern that we can use to detect it. Wait a second. I've seen this somewhere before. Let's reverse it. Wow. The audio signal of popcorn popping looks exactly like a gravitational wave from two black holes merging, like the one that LIGO discovered for the very first time in 2015. That's pretty profound, really. It's like a cosmic pop. That experiment collected years worth of data, far too much for scientists to look through, so they had algorithms running that searched the data for possible wave detections. If popcorn looks so similar, I guess we could just use their code. LIGO used something called a wavelet transform to turn a signal in time into a signal in time and frequency, just like sheet music. Then the program looks at the signal's power to determine whether it's noise or a wave. To be honest though, it's overkill. The simpler it is, the more likely it is to work, and this isn't very simple. So here's what we'll do instead. We'll just draw a line, and if the sound is louder than the line, we'll call it a pop. We should first take the absolute value, though, to get both positive and negative sides. Also, sound is a wave, so if we draw a line, the pop will cross over and under it several times, and it'll count as too many pops. So let's smooth it out. I'll use a moving average filter, which takes the average of nearby values. Then we'll make a list of ones if the signal is higher than the threshold, and zeros if it's lower. Still, we only want the time that the pop starts, so to get that, we can use convolution where you take two signals and slide one over the other. At each point, you multiply the lined up numbers and add them all together to get one point on the new signal. The small signal is sometimes called a kernel, no pun intended, and if our kernel is only a one and a negative one, the output is all of the boundaries between ones and zeros. So we just do that and take away all the negatives. We grab the locations of each spot that has a one, and there's our list of pop times. Definitely faster than writing them all down. Now that we have the times that each kernel popped at, let's plot a histogram to see if it really is Gaussian. That's not too bad. It looks like a normal curve. We could just find the mean and standard deviation to estimate the distribution, but it'll be a bit off because I stopped the microwave, so we're missing kernels on the right. Instead, let's find the curve of best fit. That looks a little better. I think it's a good probability distribution for our popcorn. The program counted 372 pops, and using the best fit Gaussian, it predicts that those represent 97% of the kernels. So there should be 12 unpopped kernels in this bag. Let's count it to see if it was right. It turns out there are 433 popped and 53 unpopped kernels. Our pop counter didn't catch every pop, and that's probably because of kernels popping at about the same time. More notably though, it overestimated the percentage by a lot. I think an easy way to fix this is to use known data on microwavable popcorn. Remember, that paper said that 9.13% of kernels were unpoppable, so let's assume instead that all of the kernels under this normal curve represent 90.87% of the kernels, and then an additional 9.13% never pop. This model predicts 56 unpopped kernels, which is much closer to the actual value. 
But the instructions on packaging usually deal with pop frequency, not time. So to find frequency as a function of desired percentage popped, consider a small interval of pop times starting at t seconds. The percentage of pops in this time is given by the area, so the expected number of pops in this time is the total number of pops times that area. The expected spacing between these pops will be the length of time we measured, divided by the number of pops in this time. With my microwave and my bags of popcorn, if I wait until there are 1.5 seconds between pops, I should have 98.3% of my poppable kernels popped. That actually is very similar to the 98.0% that I counted. It seems like the instructions might actually be pretty accurate. But let's plot the theoretical wait time between pops against desired pop percentage to see what happens at different percentages. According to our math from earlier, this should be proportional to the inverse of the PDF of the inverse CDF of the normal distribution. This part feels kind of dumb, so if there's some name for this or a way of simplifying it that I can't see, then please let me know. But what it looks like is very flat in the middle and two steep asymptotes starting around 5 and 95%. What that means is that after 95% or so is popped, really big changes in the time that we wait will lead to very small changes in the percentage popped. But waiting a really long time will just burn your popcorn, so there's no reason not to take it out. Because the pop percentage is so stable under changing wait times, it's perfectly safe to say, take out the popcorn once it slows down, because by the time that you notice that it slows down, most of your popcorn will be popped. Minus the 10% of kernels that are unpoppable. So if you want your popcorn optimally popped and not burned, never set the timer and walk away. Listen to the popping and you can't go wrong. Wow, I really didn't tell you anything new. That's exactly what it says on the instructions.